In this video, I want to go through the um, most important topics in the first learning module for fixed income uh, for the fixed income part of the curriculum at level one and that module is called fixed income um, instrument features now before we get to the actual features we'll talk about things like the maturity date the coupon rate um, the nominal value principle and and so on there will be plenty of features that we'll discuss um, in this video as well as the next two I first of all want to uh, define a couple of things and give you a bit of extra info which is in your curriculum which may easily be turned into a theoretical question. So um, when we talk about fixed income uh, uh, instruments we actually mean um, instruments of a debt nature. So let me write over here debt instruments. So inherent in this uh, is a debt relationship. Fixed income is the conventional way of calling these types of instruments because they provide you typically with a contractual fixed level of income, um, although it may not always be fixed. There is, this, is, this is in opposition to dividends, which you receive on shares, which are, of course, a, a variable uh, cash flow. Now, debt instruments, therefore, fall into two categories, broad categories. We um, differentiate between loans and uh, what is generally called bonds. Now, loans are obviously uh, private agreements between a borrower and a lender. A borrower could be an individual person. It could be a, a company um, of various size. A lender is very often a bank. Okay, we're not really going to talk about loans uh, in these videos. We'll focus more on bonds, which are securities, meaning they are financial instruments, but ones which are tradable. So securities um, or bond securities um, are based on a contractual relationship between the bond issuer, who is effectively the um, borrower of money, so issuers and um, investors or bondholders. And it's this relationship that will be at the core of our uh, learnings in this uh, video and the subsequent ones as well. Now, I told you there are a couple of important points which are little points, but they may nevertheless um, you know, be used to create a theoretical question. So let me write important points over here. Just to bear in mind, okay? So, um, in just a moment, we'll talk about who issuers of uh, bond securities are. And you'll see that one of the, you probably know this already anyway, one of the big group of issuers, one of the big groups of issuers are governments. So, the first point is that when governments borrow money, uh, and when governments um, get debt financing, they are typically financed uh, using uh, bonds. So governments are typically financed by bonds. Um, the exception is loans, they sometimes take loans from uh, supranational institutions like, for example, the World Bank or the International Monetary Fund. So loans from, e.g., example, World Bank. But other than this or the International Money Fund, uh, Monetary Fund, other than this exception, you'll, you'll typically find governments being financed by the issuance of bonds, so they become issuers of bonds. Governments do not issue shares. That's a, that hopefully is um, a point that's quite clear. In order to issue shares, you need to be a corporation. Now, the second point is coming to corporates, corporate issuers. So companies, corporate issuers typically have both um, shares outstanding because they issue equity securities shares as well as bonds which we'll discuss here but the point is they typically have just one or 
two, perhaps, you know, three types of shares. If you've studied the equity investment section of the curriculum, you'll know about the existence of ordinary or common shares, but also um, preference or preferred shares. And even ordinary shares or common shares, they may come in different classes, class A, class B, which give shareholders different rights. But you typically have one or two shares outstanding. But at the same time, you typically have, so let me write, but many um, bonds, many uh, types of debt securities outstanding, but many uh, debt securities or actual, actual issues. And these issues um, will be um, different because they'll have different maturity dates, so different dates when, they're, when the debt needs to be repaid. They may carry different coupons. Um, that's the interest on the bonds. They may be denominated in different uh, sorry, currencies. Some will be secured, some will be unsecured. So these bond issues will have their own specific individual features, which is something we'll discuss um, later on in this video. Uh, not to mention the fact that not just debt securities, but also different debt instruments. So um, they also have not just bonds, but also loans taken from, for example, banks. And the third point, which I find, um, you know, a little bit kind of out of place here, but nevertheless, you know, it's in the curriculum, it's in this, uh, it's in this learning module. So let me uh, write it down. The point is, all fixed income securities or instruments, sorry, all fixed income instruments, from the point of view of how they are presented in the balance sheet um, of the issuer are classified under liabilities. So are shown under liabilities, which is okay at a certain level of um, generalization, but you know, I'm an accountant by training um, and uh, but also a CFA charter holder, and I know certain debt securities are actually classified partially under liabilities, partial, partially under equity, uh, for example, debt securities, which are convertible into equity. Nevertheless, for the purposes of the level one exam, all fixed income instruments are classified as liabilities. So that is funding which needs to be repaid. Okay, that's fine. But this is the, the point your curriculum stresses, not all liabilities are fixed income instruments. Um, implying that if you look at the uh, liability section of the balance sheet, uh, you'll find definitely bonds which have been issued by the company, you'll find loans which have been taken on by a company, but you also, f and those are obviously uh, fixed income instruments, but you'll also find other <laughs> elements there. For example, trade payables, um, amounts of money that you need to pay to your suppliers, that's a liability, it's not a fixed income instrument. Um, you'll find things like um, deferred revenue or my favorite deferred tax liabilities, nothing to do with um, fixed income instruments, just uh, a way that under accounting standards, we show certain amounts uh, from a balance sheet perspective. Okay, so these three points I think are uh, quite important. When I was reading the uh, relevant learning module, I did pick them up. They're not related to anything we'll talk about in just a moment with regard to the actual features, but something you should potentially remember. Okay, so the time is right to talk about the actual features of um, fixed income instruments, uh, and more specifically, actually debt securities in the form of bonds. We'll, we'll talk much less about loans, more about bonds here. Now, um, very helpful, I think, in such a discussion would be to illustrate concept, the concepts with, um, with a timeline drawing on which we will uh, try to graphically depict the different moments in the life of a debt security. So this is a time axis. And over here at the very start, I'm going to say that a debt security is, is um, actually created on what we call the issue date. 
So on this date, uh, you're going to have the issuer Uh, sorry, that should say issuer. I was thinking ahead, trying to write investors, meeting with investors. Now, how that process of issuance actually works uh, constitutes separate learning modules. Um, later on in, um, in the curriculum, there are separate learning modules for how the issuance of uh, debt securities by governments works, how the situation looks like when it's corporate issuers. So there's more, a lot more learning to come here. But obviously, what will happen uh, over here is that on this date, the debt security is created. Uh, later on, we will often say that this is simply a bond. Uh, the debt security is created, it's issued, um, investors uh, buy it, and they obviously pay money. So there's money going um, this way, and this is known as the issue price. Now, at the very other end of this um, time axis, we're also going to have an important point. This is the end of a debt securities or bonds life. We call this the maturity date, or simply the maturity of the instrument. But a word I will always, sorry, also use interchangeably with uh, maturity is the redemption date. Now, this is important because um, at least in the English language, what happens on the maturity date is that the issuer and investors meet again. Although when I say again, uh, what's uh, quite important is it doesn't have to be the necessarily the same in investors who initially bought the uh, the bond. After all, um, these are securities, so. Uh, what will happen typically is that these securities will many times change hands because they will be traded by investors. So the investors appearing over here will often be completely different investors who bought at the issue date. And um, they presented the debt security, the bond, back to the issuer. And the issuer redeems the bond, they redeem the debt, hence the redemption date, hence that name. And obviously money flows this way. Now, what happens, or this, this, this flow of money, this cash flow, is known as the principal. And later on, I'll give you other names as well, like face value, par value, or nominal value. But what gets repaid over here is the principal. And this is something which is written into the uh, bond document. You, 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 you'll actually know upfront how much typically you'll get at the end of the bond's life. Now, how much do you pay for the bond initially? Well, the issue price may be the same as the principal, but it doesn't have to be. However, your book states that the issue price is typically equal to the principal, something that I don't necessarily agree with uh, always, um, especially in the case of government bonds. However, just note that your curriculum states this or your uh, books state this, that this is typically the same as the principal. Um, but there is a very important, uh, still a very important uh, piece of the of the picture missing from our illustration thus far and that's the fact that over the lifetime of a debt security we will often not always but often have um certain systematic payments which are made by the issuer to the investors now they can be of a level equal nature uh, they can be of a more sort of variable nature. We call these payments coupons uh, or interest. And actually, the next video in this um, in this uh, in this playlist is devoted to uh, interest uh, or coupon uh, payments. Um, this obviously happens on specific dates. These are called coupon or interest payment dates. And actually. When at the maturity date, investors receive what's known as the principal or face or nominal value or par value of the bond, 
you typically also receive your final coupon. Okay, so the final one of these um, payments happens also on the on happens uh, falls on the uh, on the maturity date. I think this um, this picture will aid us greatly when we now start discussing the different features, like who's the issuer, uh, you know, what happens on the maturity date, etc. But um, let me just note one more thing here. I'm just going to say it. I'm not going to write this down. Fix, how are fixed income instruments different to equity instruments? Well, first of all, um, you know, fixed income instruments typically have a maturity date, although uh, in just a few moments, time, minutes time, I will say that not all of them do, but there's typically a maturity date, okay? And very importantly, these coupon payments over here are a commitment made by the issuer to investors. They have an obligation to pay those coupon payments at a specific amount. In the case of equities, investors receive a dividend, but there is nothing guaranteed uh, about a dividend. An issuer of shares doesn't commit to pay you a dividend. After all, in order to actually create a dividend, there must be a profit in the business because dividends are essentially from a legal point of view a distribution of profit so if there is no profit there may also be no potentially no dividend right that question aside let me write down the first parameter that I that I want us to focus on and that is going to be the issuer so um you know over here the time has come to discuss the features and the first feature is the issuer and there will be plenty more to come. Um, the issuer can essentially be any legal entity um, and this legal entity uh, could be a business, it could be a, you know, a government, it could be a unit of local government, an agency, whatever, who's going to be liable, responsible for making those uh, payments to which uh, we are committed under a bond agreement. So coupons and then um, the, the payment of principal at the end, potentially at the end of the bond's life. Uh, however, you know, we do um, group issuers into certain types or into certain categories. So let me say issuer types over here. And we're going to differentiate following what's uh, what's uh, in the curriculum into actually two categories. So I'm going to say over here, the government sector. And uh, on the right-hand side, I will write down private sector. Now let's begin with the government sector. Um, here we've got, once again, a bit of variety. Uh, we may have um, the uh, sort of the central government, the national government. Um, we also call this sovereign uh, or a sovereign issuer. A lot of the time we also say treasury securities. Treasury securities are issued by the state treasury, so by the national government or the sovereign government. And the important thing to absolutely note, and this is going to be, you know, stay with us across uh, the, 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 the whole curriculum, or at least its fixed income section, is that Typically, it is these national or sovereign issuers who present, typically, not always, there's always exceptions, um, they have the lowest uh, credit risk, meaning the lowest, they're associated with the lowest risk of potentially not the investor not receiving uh, the, the money back. And that's because, as we will later uh, also talk about, um, you know, national or sovereign issuers uh, and their ability to repay their debt um, is backed by their ability to um, enforce taxes. And, um, you know, that's uh, the, the fiscal power of the government is essentially what backs these, uh, these types of national debts. Um, now, also, under the heading government sector, we're going to have local government. Uh, so things like cities, 
states, various units of uh, local administration, we often associate this borrower with the word municipal, with the phrase municipal. Um, what else? You should know about uh, certain supranational so this is above national level, supranational um, organizations. And here we may have, for example, the World Bank uh, as, 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 as an issuer of bonds at a supranational level. And um, one more that your curriculum mentions also under the government sector is going to be quasi-government entities. Don't worry about remembering these, right? It's not, um, it's not something that you need to commit to memory, just something that you need to be aware of. Quasi-government entities, which obviously means kind of government entities. In various countries around the world, you're going to have certain agencies which are backed by the government or uh, run by the government, and they may issue their own debt securities uh, as well. Because they're part of the government complex, we treat them as uh, as quasi government. Your curriculum also brings up the um, um, brings up the uh, issue of um, or the example of the postal service in many countries, for example, being part of the government complex, and that could be considered kind of quasi government. But in many in other places, uh, the postal service may be run as a as a privatized company. Uh, so that would fall in under the heading private sector. Right, so moving here, under the private sector, we will definitely have um, corporate issuers, so companies. And that's quite obvious. This will also, uh, for example, include banks, which are um, a big issuer of, um, of bonds. And additionally to this, um, and there will be more on this to come, something called ABSs, which stands for Asset uh, Backed Securities. Now, Asset Backed Securities are not really the issuer. Um, the issuer here is actually, maybe I should create this link up here and break this down, SPV. Okay, that's a better way uh, to, to denote it. The issuer is the SPV, and what they issue is an asset-backed security. Issuer issues this. Okay, because we are talking about issuer types, it's more appropriate to talk about the SPV as a type of issuer. SPV stands for Special Purpose Vehicle. Another way to describe this, instead of using the phrase SPV, is to say SPE, where it's still special purpose, but we'll use entity instead of vehicle. What this is, is a specially set up company. And the job of this company, it, it just has one thing to do. It's to issue something called asset-backed securities. Um, later on, I'll show you um, how these things work when we talk about sources of repayment on bonds. But generally, what will happen is you set up a, a, a special company who's, you know, it's, it's special, it's, it's special, it's specially set up for just this one purpose. That's why we call it a special purpose vehicle or indeed entity. And what they typically do, these companies, is they buy up, um, for example, uh, loans, mortgage loans, or any other asset that may produce a regular steady stream of income cash flows. And that income, those cash flows, are then the source of payments made to investors in ABSs. So the issuer is the SPV or SPE. And I think this covers um, the topic of issuers. Okay, so I've kind of docked the issuer feature on the left hand side and I now want to move on to the next feature or parameter that's going to be the uh, maturity date or simply the maturity and um, one thing we need to do is to define this this is the date obviously on which now very importantly the final 
payment is made to investors. After uh, the maturity date, there are no other payments uh, that will be made. The instrument, the debt security is essentially no longer with us. Um, it's not necessarily the date on which the principal is paid, because as you'll see, uh, I think two videos down the line, there are securities which pay, uh, or maybe three videos down the line, I'm not sure, uh, which pay principal uh, not just on a single date, but across their lifetime. They're so called, uh, they're called amortizing uh, debt securities. Nevertheless, you know, this is this is the thing to remember. It's the, fi when the date on which the final payment is made. And um, I want to introduce one other word, which is quite important and often associated with debt securities, which is linked to maturity, and that's the tenor. Now, different people use this word in a different way, so don't be shocked if you are used to this word being used in a slightly different context, but this is the time, or your curriculum defines this as the time remaining to maturity, and um, associated with this. So this is basically a time that's going to shrink as as uh, as time passes, essentially. Um, but I want you to um, appreciate that depending on uh, the securities tenor as measured or as assessed at the issue date over here, so when a, a security is freshly being issued, depending on how much life there is ahead of it, so it's tenor at issuance, we're going to classify securities into at least two categories, depending on whether that tenor is um, within or above what, a one-year period. So those which, which fall within this one-year period, the 12-month period, are going to be often referred to as money market securities. And these will include things like treasury bills. Treasury bills are government-issued um, short-term securities with a, a an initial tenor of not, not more than one year. On the other hand, uh, and actually similar instruments may also be issued by companies, but then they're not called bills, they're called commercial paper. You'll learn about these later on uh, when we discuss... Um, corporate bonds. However, everything else, everything that has a longer uh, maturity is going to be um, referred to as capital market securities. The capital market is where um, issuers or borrowers obtain funding of a long term, longer term nature. So capital market securities over here and Quite importantly, your your book does or your, your your curriculum does make this point. This also includes so including something called perpetual bonds. Perpetual bonds don't have a uh, stated maturity date. So no stated maturity date. That's a that's an important feature to bear in mind. And they are typically issued, not by everybody, typically issued by, um, well, let's, let's draw this over here, governments. Um, the UK government is one prominent issuer of uh, so-called perpetual bonds. But also, and but this doesn't have to be the central sort of uh, national government. This can also be local government, but also banks sometimes issue these types of securities with no stated maturity date. So, you know, gearing you up for what potentially may be a theoretical question. And your book, your curriculum also you know, goes on a little bit about these perpetual bonds and how they are different to equities because you know equities also don't have um, a maturity date so 
what's the difference here with these bonds, which also don't have a maturity date. So once again, just for the possibility that you'll get a question on this. Differences to shares, meaning to equities. So the common thing is that they've got no maturity date, these perpetual bonds, but this is where the, I guess, the commonality uh, stops. These perpetual bonds contain no voting rights. Shares, naturally, uh, at least common shares, give their shareholders voting rights. The second point is, um, in the case of bonds, the issuer has you know, a commitment to pay these coupons or interest, interest slash coupons. And this is not something you'll find with, uh, with shares. Shares don't contain the issuer's commitment to pay uh, anything uh, guaranteed. And the final point is, and here we'll, we'll have the, for the first time, the appearance of a, of a new word, which will use quite a lot later on, bonds, including perpetual bonds, have higher um, so-called seniority uh, than shares, than uh, equities. Um, this is important in case of company liquidation. If a company goes, let's say, bankrupt and is liquidated, its assets are used to repay money to providers of funding. And uh, holders of bonds, including perpetual bonds, will rank higher in terms of their seniority um, than holders of shares. Okay, the next feature which I want us to talk about is the uh, principle. Now, I wrote that name down. Over here is something that is being paid uh, on the maturity date. And over here, the issue price, I said, it's typically equal to the principal with some reservations that that's not always the case. Well, how is the principal really defined? It's the amount that's going to be um, repaid by the is issuer. So amount which the issuer agrees to repay, but critically, on, or, sorry, that should read on, or before the maturity date. So if it's on the maturity date, it's just going to be a single payment, and we call such payments bullet payments. You'll learn about this uh, in the subsequent learning module. Um, if there are payments, uh, repayments of principal before, that basically means that the, the repayment is spread out over many dates, in which case you'll be looking at a uh, what's known as an amortizing security. Uh, however, let me also write down over here that the principal is aka, also known as, and we'll use these names, the face value of a... Uh, bond, its par value, or simply par, or simply face. Um, one more that you'll often come across is the nominal value, although your curriculum doesn't really use this one. Face, par, principle, these are the, the terms that the curriculum uses quite a lot. Now, um, okay, let's leave principle here. I'm not going to wipe this off. There isn't much more to say, um, at least um, in this learning module. Um, another feature, so let me put this down here, is the seniority, something I uh, mentioned uh, before. The seniority, um, what it does is it determines the priority of uh, repayment. Now, Normally, um, all bondholders need to be or should be repaid, but um, this is this becomes important in the case of um, issuer trouble, issuer um, you know bankruptcy or liquidation.
when the issuer of a of a bond uh, gets into financial difficulties, who's going to be repaid? Uh, maybe the money will not be enough to, or the funds available will not be enough for everybody to get a repayment. So who's first? So this is uh, all about priority, but obviously priority relative to the holders of um, to the other obligations of the issuer. Obligations of the issuer, and um, later on we'll talk about the fact that some bonds are ranked as or are created as senior bonds, which come higher. Um, some are junior, some are secured, some are unsecured, etc. This is all to do with the concept of seniority. And there is one more parameter or one more feature that I want to discuss in this video. However, it's not the final one. Um, what I want to write down is um, contingency provisions. I'll explain what that means in a moment. Contingency provisions. However, as I said, it's not the final feature because uh, what we're missing from this list so far is the coupon. Um, and because that coupon is such an important feature with so many different um, things that can happen there, so many things to discuss, I'll discuss it separately in the next video. Um, so for now, my list of features is going to close with so something called contingency provisions, but by no means is this a full list yet. Um, contingency provisions are going to be um, clauses, so specific legal uh, provisions written into the bond uh, contract, so cl a clause which um, allows for a specific action, allowing for a specific action, so some specific behaviour, in case of a specific event, I know it doesn't really sound like something very precise, in case of a specific event um, or a specific uh, circumstance. And um, let me just give you one or two examples of this. The most uh, common ones are going to be something called embedded options. Options which are optional features which are embedded into a bond. For example, a call option. This is something which we'll, which we will discuss in, in a lot more detail later on, but it gives the issuer the right to bring forward the redemption date or the maturity date and repay the debt, repay the principal ahead of the official sort of schedule. Um, we can also get a put option or have a put option built into a bond. Um, it contains a similar right uh, to accelerate the uh, redemption, the maturity, but this time uh, it's in the hands of the investors, the bondholders. They decide whether they want to um, exercise that option. Um, there are also embedded options which come in the form of uh, the possibility to convert to equity. So uh, conversion options meaning that when the um, this is conversion when the maturity date comes the investor may decide whether they want to receive a fixed amount of principal for example a thousand dollars or a certain number uh, once again a predetermined number of the issuers shares um, you know that's something a specific action in case of a specific event or circumstance which needs to be specified in the bond contract in order for it to be um, then able uh, to happen uh, during the life of the bond.